you know, as an explorer, sometimes I feel a little bit down to earth when I speak of the profitability coming from the technologies which protect the environment. Because as an explorer, I should do something much more philosophical. I should say nature is beautiful. Life is magical on this planet. We have a miracle of this blue planet floating in the universe. Okay, but if you say that, the problem is that it doesn't change anything to the world. It doesn't change the business leaders who are going for profit. It doesn't change the uh, politicians who go for job creation in order to be reelected. So basically you speak of the miracle of life, but it doesn't change human nature. So I tried to also be an explorer in the way I address these issues and find other ways to do, other ways to think, other ways to act. And this is also the task of an explorer. And what I found is that it is much more efficient to speak about how to earn more money and create more jobs by being cleaner, more efficient, and better protecting the environment. So it's a very down-to-earth message, but the result is very effective. Very effective because people listen. My guest today is a living legend in making historic round-the-world trips that have come to redefine what is possible for humanity. Serial explorer, psychiatrist, and ambassador for clean technologies, Dr. Bertrand Picard has done it all and is probably planning to do it all again in ways that continue to shift paradigms and unveil the new futures that are available to us today. When Bertrand took the controls of the Breitling Orbiter in 1999 with his teammate, Brian Jones, he went on to complete the first nonstop around the world balloon flight. While in 2016, he successfully piloted the first ever around the world solar powered flight and took turns with Andre Borsberg in the now iconic solar impulse plane. More recently, the United Nations Goodwill Ambassador for the Environment, Special Advisor to the European Commission and Founder and Chairman of Solar Impulse Foundation has been on another trip around the world, this time in pursuit of 1,000 plus innovative solutions that can protect the environment in a profitable way. So it is a huge honor to welcome Bertrand on Inside Ideas podcast to find out more about the thousand plus solutions and to hear about the future he thinks is possible for people and planet. Bertrand, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad you could find the time in your busy schedule. You're out there doing amazing things for our planet and for innovation and technology. He's a true pioneer, a disruptor for our world. Uh, we our paths have crossed a couple of times just for my listeners at, at most of the cops we see each other when you're speaking and I'll, I'll always harass you for a selfie and, and try to say hi because I'm just enamored with your your talks your achievements and um, matter of fact I've got your book the greatest adventure right here I've read it a couple of times it it is best uh, bestseller in my household and I really love it how you describe your generational history as explorers in your family, your grandfather and, and your father did some pretty amazing feats, Mariana Trench and, and something similar to the stratosphere. Is that very similar to what um, Felix did as well, jumping from the stratosphere from a, a balloon? Well, what my grandfather did was not a sport uh, action like Felix Baumgartner. It, it was a scientific exploration. And uh, actually, my grandfather is the first person ever who entered into the stratosphere. And he was the first man to see the curvature of the Earth with his own eyes. And uh, that was possible because he invented the pressurized cabin, uh, which is now used in every airplane and spacecraft. So he invented that in 1930, made the first flight in 31. And his goal was to study the cosmic rays, but also to open the way to modern aviation, showing that flying in thinner air would allow airplanes to fly faster 
with less gasoline, less kerosene. And that was his, his way to contribute to protection of the environment. Try to have air traffic more efficient and stop wasting too much gasoline as when you fly in thicker air at lower altitude. I love that. Uh, and, and your father did the Mariana Trench as, as well. And you. Yeah, that was the balloon upside down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, the principle of the Batiscape that was inv invented by my grandfather is like a stratospheric balloon. You have the float. Uh, in the case of the Batiscape, it is full of gasoline that makes it lighter than water. So, not gasoline that you burn, huh? don't be afraid just to have a buoyancy lighter than water. And you have a cabin that is uh, pressurized, of course, and it goes down to the bottom of the Marina Trench, 11 kilometers down. And to go up, uh, my father dropped some ballast and could be lighter and go back to the surface. Like in a balloon, you, you drop ballast to, to climb. And the, the goal of this dive, of course, it was a historic first, but the goal was much more than that. It was to show that there was life in the deepest trenches in a period of time where the governments wanted to use the bottom of the oceans to drop the radioactive and toxic wastes. And uh, if there is nothing down there, it's maybe not as dangerous. But when my father and his colleague Don Walsh could prove that there was life, they saw some shrimps, they saw a flat fish living on the, on the bottom. So that was the proof that there was oxygen coming from the surface because oxygen is only made at the surface by the phytoplankton. And if it reaches 11 kilometers down, it's because you have vertical currents. And vertical currents going down means vertical currents, currents going up again and the circulation of the water. And if you have a circulation of the water, all the toxic things you throw down there will pollute the entire ocean. So that was a big milestone for the protection of the oceans. So it's just ingrained in your family, I believe that you, you guys are just not, not just doing explorers and these adventures, but you really want to make sure we don't destroy our planet. We, we don't do things that could come back to bite us and hurt us in the long run. I mean, you, you would think that would be common sense to there is no throw away on this planet that people wouldn't want to just dispose of things without it coming back to bite us because we're in this closed system, spaceship Earth, that they wouldn't realize there's diatoms and calcium carbonate and other microorganisms, even if they're not like fish and, and shrimp that uh, uh, maybe can be like plankton as well, that really go up that food chain and have a big, huge impact. And so I, I thank you for sharing that story. The last time we saw each other was actually at the World Economic Forum in 2020, right after DLD, and and uh, we 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 saw each other there, and, and um, it I, and maybe maybe I'm even wrong. It was actually at COP 25 in Madrid was the last time we saw each other. Absolutely. That's when we saw each other. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, and. Um, Again, I got my selfie, but we had a, a little bit of a discussion as well. And you're always surrounded and doing a lot of events. That meeting was was really a difficult one. Um, it seemed like we were getting ready to go into the decade of action. And, and uh, the, it was extended. The COP25 was extended a few days because they couldn't come to some decisions. And there was just this huge frustration when we left at that nothing was achieved again. And the, the reason I bring that up is because one, not only in your family and generation, you've been doing this for a long time, pioneer, adventurer, ambassador, really talking about how we can do and use different operating models to stop human suffering and stop destroying our planet, fix the environment, use other types of clean technologies, and then boom, we were hit with the pandemic and uh, lockdowns and, and Black Lives Matters and uh, Asian racism, the inauguration craziness and, and uh, many, many other crazy things that uh, we're, we're, we're just really saying, what's going on with our world? I want to know, how did you weather this time, this crazy time? You, one, you, you achieve the 1,000 plus solutions. So I know there's some positive stories, but did you also see 
because you've applied those things into your life that you talk about, that you do, that you explore and, and are kind of surrounded by pioneers and innovators. Did you really see there's some better business models, some better operating systems for life that can get us through these hard times like a pandemic, like these Black Lives Matters and the other nationalism that we're seeing around the world? You know, before the COVID crisis, the world was unfair. It was fragile. It was inefficient, polluting. We were doing a lot of wrong things. Socially, it's unacceptable to have so much inequality. And uh, why was it like this? Because, you know, since decades, there was no war in Europe. There was no war in America and uh, no pandemics. And it was like if human beings were stronger than nature, stronger than life, stronger than the world. And it made human beings so arrogant. It gave them the impression that they could do absolutely anything and there would be no consequence. And this pandemic is a lesson of humility. It shows that human beings are vulnerable, much more vulnerable than what they thought. And they really have to be careful. Human beings have to be careful between each other because you can have real terrible social riots and unrest and suffering that are unacceptable. But with the environment, it's the same. We have to be much more careful in what we do, much more respectful. The problem is that when you say that, it's a little bit of a wishful thinking. Can human beings become wise suddenly? I don't think so. I think as soon as the pandemic will be forgotten, uh, people will go back to a normal behavior. And this is why we really need at the opportunity of this pandemic to see which would be the, the common interest of the world to change a couple of things. And uh, the billions of dollars that are now flooding on the market in order to have a post-COVID recovery is maybe a way, and I hope it will be, to reorient the functioning of our society in a more efficient way, in a way that is cleaner, that is polluting less, in a circular economy. Uh, the solutions are there. I'm sure we're going to speak about it. The solutions exist to do it. Now, what we need is that the regulation and the funding will go in the direction that we need, Otherwise, we'll go back to the world we had before, and all these crises will have been completely useless. Yeah, I, there, there's actually, and I think you surmised it so, so well, there's actually legal frameworks out there in our world that allow corporations and cities and governments to, to pollute legally um, and incentivize, you know, for fossil fuels and many other things. So that, that kind of brings me to a little bit bigger question right here at the beginning. I'm, I'm sorry to, to jump right into it. Um, during, dur not just during the pandemic, but even before, as you so uh, eloquently described to us that we've been doing this for, for a while, we felt this unrest that our current civilization models, our economic models and models anywhere in the world, they're just not working for us anymore. And uh, what I see, not only you mentioning the circular economy, and there's many others out there like planetary boundaries and donut economics and Mariana Matsukato, who, who we've probably seen at uh, uh, Davos before, yes. speaks on mission economics uh, or mission economy as well. And there's so many different type of models out there. And I think they're all moving in the same direction and hopefully they're all collaborating. But do you also feel that our current frameworks around the world, whether it's in extractive economies or these uh, fossil fuel incentives or the bolts and arrows burning down the rainforest, that they're just not working for humanity anymore? And we need to transition over to some better models, some ones that work for everyone? You know, it's not the fact that our model is suddenly not good. Humankind is using the same model since, since ever. We always extracted goods, destroyed nature, cut the trees. You can see Eastern Island, how they cut all the trees and now you have no possibility of 
good quality of life because they have no forest anymore. The wind is just bringing the salt of the sea on the island. It, it's crazy. And uh, there were slaves, there were wars, there were crimes since centuries. But what was maybe possible with half a billion or one billion or maybe two billion people on the planet is not possible anymore with eight billion. And today it's an exponential increase of all the problems, of all the suffering, of all the pollution. So it's not suddenly that we have a model that doesn't work. It, it never worked, but it was accepted because there were not too many people on earth. Now it's not acceptable anymore because we see that with this model, we destroy everything. So we have to find a new model. And when we speak of new model, um, it's interesting to see that if you are kind, if you have kindness for your uh, employees, for your suppliers, for your clients, you make better business. You know, there were studies showing that. You, uh, you, we, we have now with the Solar Impulse Foundation the proof that you can be more profitable if you bring efficient, clean technologies, renewable energies to the market. So basically, we, are not, we don't need to change the fact that people need a reward for what they do, uh, but they have to get a reward that makes good instead of doing bad. And we see that today, the protection of the environment can be linked to a fantastic job creation, to a lot of profit for the industry, giving salaries, pay, paying taxes, uh, preparing the pension funds for the people who are retired. So all the social uh, support that the population needs, we can do it now in a way that does not destroy the, the environment. I'm, I'm glad you touched upon that because really, especially during this pandemic time, we've seen that um, those companies, those organizations, those corporations that invested in sustainable index funds and environmental social governance and shifted their business models to clean tech and, and to care about their working conditions for their employees and, and those pillars that you spoke about, they all outperformed their conventional counterparts during this time in the middle of a recession, a pandemic and, and crisis of, of financial markets and, and, and all sorts of things. And not just Nikkei Index, the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, but the Morningstar Review, uh, 25 out of 28, they all outperformed their conventional counterparts, those who were not somehow doing a push towards not just sustainability, but environmental social governance. And that was in the first, second, and third, third and fourth quarters of 2020. And we haven't seen it slowing now. It's actually on an uptick. And I'm sure you, you have some really... I guess this is a different way of formulating. It's a better business model to do offer planetary services and have these things ingrained in your business model because not only do your employees, your customers, everybody benefit from that, the world is much better for it. You know, as an explorer, sometimes I feel a little bit down to earth when I speak of the profitability coming from the technologies which protect the environment. Because as an explorer, I should do something much more philosophical. I should say, nature is beautiful. Life is magical on this planet. We have a miracle of this blue planet floating in the universe. Okay, but if you say that, the problem is that it doesn't change anything to the world. It doesn't change the business leaders who are going for profit. It doesn't change the uh, politicians who go for job creation in order to be re-elected. So basically you speak of the miracle of life, but it doesn't change human nature. So I tried to also be an explorer in the way I address these issues and find other ways to do, other ways to think, other ways to act. And this is also the task of an explorer. And what I found is that it is much more efficient to speak about how to earn more money and create more jobs by being cleaner 
more efficient and better protecting the environment. So it's a very down to earth message, but the result is very effective. Very effective because people listen. Uh, each time I was talking about protection of the environment to heads of state, they were telling me, okay, yes, we know we have to do something, but basically we cannot lose money to protect the environment. We need to guarantee our, our economical growth. And now I can go back to them and say, if you really aim for economical growth, you will earn much more. If you link the GDP to the efficiency, instead of linking it to the consumption. And it starts to be a bit technical, but what does it mean? It means that until now, the GDP, that means the wealth created by humankind, was increasing at the same rate than pollution, at the same rate than CO2 emissions, at the same rate than the depletion of natural resources. And of course, you cannot continue like that because you're going to destroy everything. But you can do the opposite now. Now we have enough technologies, enough renewable energies to allow our world to be much more efficient. And instead of selling more goods, we sell more efficiency. So new technologies, modernization of the infrastructure, new services. And here you make more money in the industry and you create more jobs, but you don't pollute more, you pollute less because you save natural resources, you save energy, you, you decrease the consumption, but you increase the wealth. And I believe this is really a win-win that allows to reconcile ecology and economy. I believe you touched upon it uh, in, the, in the beginning a little bit, where, and I don't, I don't know if this ties to you being a psychiatrist and the way you, what things you've learned and, and that, but is there, because it's been there from the beginning, is there something like human nature, the human condition that it's almost like by birth where we're set off on, we have something that we're fighting against, uh, why we don't do it or why it takes so long for us to click that we're come up out of this earth, that we're part of a symbiotic earth, that we're connected, that, that, that we can extract from our kin and our cousins and, and, and that connectedness but not in a spiritual way or say, you know, the, the, the kind of how, how, how you so eloquently said it. Is there anything through that that you've learned over time? Is it really uh, something else in there? Yes, I believe human nature is not bad in itself. I don't, the, the vast majority of people don't want to be bad by choice. Uh, they, want to advantage themselves first. People are very open to be nice to others, but as long as they can have what they want, which means that they, each one is putting himself with quite short term personal interest instead of long term interest for the others. So this is a big gap between what human being would like to be and what it is really. So you have two, two ways to, to react to this. Either you want to change human nature and you go into the wishful thinking. Human beings should be generous, should be respectful. We have to educate people to think more about the others. It, it will take, well, I don't know how much time it will take because uh, you have already a lot of people who tried uh, thousands of years ago. It, it doesn't really change human nature. Or what you do is that you work with what human nature is. If people want to have short-term personal interest, give them a short-term personal interest to protect the environment, to be good to others, to be generous. And today, there are a lot of studies that show Exactly this, if you are generous, you, you have more in return. If you are kind to people, people will work better with you. If you are cleaner and more efficient, you will earn more money. So instead of opposing what human nature is and what human nature should be, you reconcile the two. And I think this is really something people have to understand today. Stop dreaming 
and act. Stop to be wishful thinking and just do with the tools that exist today. And the tools that exist today start to work. When you see that oil companies, oil producing companies, start to disinvest from oil in order to put more into uh, hydrogen, renewable energy, clean electricity, energy efficiency, it shows that it's a, it's a move that is going in the right direction. I totally agree, and, and it's beautiful because those uh, are stranded assets, and, and, and that human condition really is we, we, we trade what we want now for what we want most, and, and I, I see that as well. I love that you're, even though it's not in your biography or what you do, but because you're an ambassador and you're speaking to these heads of state and leaders around the world, you have this beautiful diplomacy. So uh, you're a, a very great diplomat to kind of open our eyes to different possibilities. And, and you do it through actions and, and things that you've done. And, and I think that's something that we could all use more. I, I don't know if you've ever felt this way when you've been at the cops before, but I always get overwhelmed. It's two weeks of, of um, you know, eight to 12 hours a day of General Assembly, pavilions, talks, the green zone, the bulla zone. And it seems like everybody's shouting their own message at the same time. And it's almost impossible to, to make a choice and to find a, a common path. And, and I also tie that a little bit to that human condition. Why are we competing against each other? We actually should be moving in the same direction. And, and then, then we, when we don't come to any consensus or, or double down on, on what needs to be done, it can be a little bit frustrating. And that leads me to, to um, my next biggest question for you is, there's this talk about global citizenry or globalization. And how would you feel or what are your views on a world without nations and borders, division of humanity one from another, something more of this global citizenry that um, we have these basic inalienable rights as humanity and we're not getting down to these nationalistic perspectives and, and kind of competing once one with each other because we're all crew members on this spaceship or can you maybe give us your thoughts and feelings and what direction we will go or where we're at and how to understand that better? How would you feel if human beings were all saints, holy people, with compassion and generosity and wisdom? I, I wouldn't feel good at all. I'd feel uncomfortable, probably. But you know, it's, it's the same question. If everybody was wise, holy, and uh, generous, and respectful, maybe you could have everything good on the earth. You wouldn't need borders. You, you, you would not need citizenship. People would not protect themselves against others because everybody would be nice. But it's a complete wishful thinking. Uh, human beings are not like this. So I think it's wonderful to dream, but to dream at things you can get, not to dream at things that you cannot get and that make you frustrated. Because you will always have borders, at least the way human beings are today. Maybe there will be a spiritual revelation where human beings suddenly will be enlightened and they will suddenly bring peace and destroy the borders. But until that moment, <laughs> there will be borders, there will be wars, there will be pollution. And the goal is to try to reduce the wars, to reduce the pollution, to reduce the selfishness, to reduce violence. But you will not change human nature. And if you find somebody who can change human nature, please tell me, I would love it. But I didn't find that until now. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some old scientists. Um, uh, she, she doesn't live anymore. Her name's Lynn Margulis. Uh, she wrote a bunch of books and she was actually Carl Sagan's first wife. She did a, a documentary called Symbiotic Earth, but also wrote um, the microcosmos and many other things and says that we're, really connected with the biome of our earth, the microorganisms, and, and it's not wishful thinking or, or hocus pocus, but that if the earth's biome is not doing well, our human biome is not doing well, and that, that there's some connectedness there. And, and it's based off of 
of science and that this there is no neoliberalism neo-darwinism you know survival of the fittest natural selection only the strong survive that it's more of a planet of cooperation and collaboration that i i, I really feel that you know air water um species are all global citizens they can all cross borders the, the pandemic was a, a global citizen and and some decisions on these political or these national levels are are decisions or or, or bad systems that are affecting us clear across the world and we're not even a citizen of of those nations and so that's kind of my terminology of you know how are we going to realize that we're eventually all crew members on the spaceship earth and and, and kin um but but i like how you answered it and i i i, I want to get away from that wishful thinking because i think you can wish in one hand and you can have some action in the other in one hand you have some action and and hopefully positive results in the other hand there's a there's an empty wish yeah and, because and, look I met a lot of heads of states, a, a lot of business leaders, but even if they feel that they are crew members of the same spaceship Earth and so on, they, these guys, they want to be re-elected, they want to pay the salaries of their employees, uh, they want to pay dividends to the shareholders, and they are not going to sacrifice this to feel that they are passengers of a spaceship where everybody should be nice and treated equally. They're going to, to buy it in order to, to gain as much money as they can. And this you will not change. Uh, so my, my way of understanding the situation is to bring to these people enough ways to gain money enough ways to pay salaries, to create jobs, to be re-elected if it's a politician, enough ways, but protecting the environment and not destroying it, making good instead of making bad, ways to, 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 to go in the good direction, even if the personal interest of the person is maybe a bit selfish or very much selfish. I think you can reconcile the two. And, and this is all the work I'm doing now. You know, since four years, I've been looking at technological solutions that can protect the environment because we absolutely need to save our future on earth. But at the same time, these solutions have to be profitable and create jobs. And in the beginning, you know, there was a big suspense. I thought, is it possible or not? Because basically you have ecological solutions, but they are, not necessarily profitable. You have industrial products that make a lot of profits, but maybe uh, they kill the environment. So how can you make the, the intersection between the two? The one who protect the environment and are profitable. And if this exists, then you have, an, then you have a possible answer. And for four years, I was looking for that. A lot of people telling me it's impossible, you, you will never do it. You either have to be ecological and fight against the industry or be in the industry and destroy the environment. I said, no, you can do both. And the 13th of April of this year, 2021, we passed the goal of the thousand solutions. We have now a thousand one hundred. And there are technologies, systems, products, materials, processes, programs, sources of energy that really protect the environment in the field of water, energy, mobility, construction, agriculture, industry, all these SDGs, they can be reached, but in a profitable way. And, and this was my bet. And now we, we have them, these solutions. And the goal is to bring them massively to the key decision makers and I want to tell them, it's not just because it's ecological, it's also logical. It makes economical sense. And you will earn more money now if you protect the environment than if you destroy it. And this is really what I'm working on because I don't want at the end of my life to look backward and say, I was wishful thinking, I was waiting human nature to be better. I was hoping the planet would be a paradise for everybody. 
and be disappointed. I, I hate these wishful thinking dreams. So I want to really do something that changes the situation. And maybe I will look back at my life and I will say, okay, maybe it was an important contribution. Maybe it was not enough, but at least it made a part of it. I love that about you. And, and there's, you're in good company. So Paul Hawken with his drawdown, he also says, you know, I want it to be a noun. I want to solve and have the solutions and have the things I don't want to wish. And I'm not very relying upon hope. And congratulations on your thousand plus achievement. I looked at the website just before we started the podcast and it was, I believe, 1,151, something around there. So it's climbing and growing. You have some fabulous tools on the website where you can go through and pick the SDG that you like and see which, uh, uh, how it's linked to certain solutions and efficiencies. You've come up with almost kind of a brand of efficiency label for each of those solutions and tons of support to get them up to scale. And, and I absolutely love it that that's the direction we're going. There was another book released just during the, the pandemic as well. I don't know if you know Mark C. Jacobson, 100% clean renewable energy and um, the storage for everything. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's amazing because now here, okay, this is how we've done it in the past. This is what's, but here, here let's show there are other ways, there are other solutions. And um, what I really like is the support your foundation gives, not just with the tools and, and the, the branding and, and help, but you want to see them get to scale and change the infrastructure. Tell us a little bit more about what you're excited about there and what are the next phases that you're moving into? The next phase is to bring these solutions to business leaders and the heads of states to give them the tools to reach their environmental pledges. Because you have so many who now are obliged to say, we want to be carbon neutral in 2050. Okay, wonderful. How do they do it? What's the roadmap? And they have no idea. They have no idea. So I want to give them the way to, to do it. Because today, you know, you can be so much more efficient in terms of use of energy, in terms of re natural resources, food, waste. Each time, technologies make you more profitable. So basically, you go from a world where the infrastructures are losing a lot of, uh, of, well, of, of wealth. 75% of the energy used in the world or produced in the world is lost. You know, half of the food, 95% of the waste. So that's, that's the old world. Now you have to turn it into a world where you produce enough energy with renewable sources, and to allow this to happen, you need to save energy because it's ridiculous to produce 100% of the energy we have today with renewable sources and keep on waste, wasting and losing so much energy because of the inefficiency. So maybe you can divide by two the consumption of energy and you only need to have 50% of renewable energy and it will be absolutely carbon neutral. No more, no more fuel, no more fossil energy, but no more waste, no more inefficiency. And you do that for everything. And I came to a conclusion where the, the people will be ready to do it. If you have a modernization of the legal framework, because today it's allowed to pollute, you can put as much CO2 as you want in the atmosphere, there's no limit. So a lot of companies are telling you what we do is legal. It's legal, it's allowed. So we need to make it illegal, to make it forbidden. And if you do that in a legal framework, it will pull by necessity all the solutions to the market, all the new solutions. It will oblige people to use renewable energy. It will oblige people to be efficient it will oblige people to recycle the ways to go into a renewable uh, uh, circular economy, I mean. And the good news is that it pays for itself. 
So there is no excuse today for inaction. The more you wait, the less you will earn money on this new process. So sorry to speak so much about money, but- uh, No, it it's important. It the thing that drives the economy, that drives finance and the industry. And if you tell them there are 1000 solutions now that are profitable, startups ready to put their products on the market, but they need investment to grow. They need regulation to have their products being pulled to the market. Then you really have a program. It's not a wishful thinking. It is something that creates a lot of excitement. And, and to give you an example, we will announce end of May this year, 2021, uh, the creation of two investment funds, one with BNP Paribas, one with Rothschild, uh, in order to help all these startups to grow, to have what they need to bring their products on the market and protect the environment. So the, the financial world is interested by it. The industrial world is interested by it. We need to push a little bit more the governments to modernize the legal framework. So all these new type of technologies will really be used by everybody. Are there, I know there's 1,151 as of today, but are there, uh, and without doing too much favoritism, are there some that you're just saying, these have wowed me, inspired Mary. These are really game changers we haven't seen before and have uh, the, the opportunity to make huge impacts or, or do, it does not work like that. It works exactly like that. You're absolutely right, Mark. And I give you an example. What do you see coming out of the chimney of a factory since centuries? You see yeah, two greenhouse gases, yeah. And greenhouse gas. Who notices that in the chimney you have heat that is lost? Nobody thinks about it, but it's the fact. The factories are losing the heat through the chimney. Well, there are several companies who have the label of the Solar Impulse Foundation who found ways to recover this heat, to store it, and to give it back to the factory. So the company who sells this system makes profits and creates jobs. The company who buys the product saves energy and has a lower energy bill at the end of the month. That's the type of win-win that I love. There's another nice example. It's a, um, a software that you install on your car. It's called the WeNow. It analyzes the CO2 emitted by the car and gives you another way to drive. It shows you when you can accelerate or when you have to decelerate in order to save your gasoline. If you put this on a fleet of a big company or the vehicles of the company, it is up to 17, 17% of fuel saving. It's enormous. You have the way to optimize the flight of the airplanes in order to reduce fuel consumption in the air. You have processes with constant descent approach where the airplane, instead of flying like this and ends up gear down, full flaps, full power, wasting energy, it just glides down like the space shuttle for landing with engines idle. For a jumbo jet, it is one ton of kerosene that is saved at every landing. All these type of things, they exist. They just have to be implemented. Why, why aren't we implementing them faster? Is because we don't know they existed or what's the hesitation that we didn't make that transition? Are we still holding on to the last bits of fossil fuels in the old industrial revolution? Why haven't we jumped into those a lot sooner? Four years ago, I did not know they existed. And it took me four years to see that there are 1,151 of these solutions. And probably there are still another great lot of them elsewhere that we haven't found yet. So for people who are dealing with their habits, with their beliefs, with their routine, it's very difficult to see what exists that would make their business better. So it's our task 
to promote it, to speak about it. It's our task to bring it in the media, to speak about it at uh, economical forums, industrial forums, innovation forums, political gatherings. No, uh, uh, President Emmanuel Macron asked me to speak at the G7 uh, in, in front of the other heads of state about these type of things. The, the, this is, I believe, the, the important leverage. I love that. Is there, um, so I mean, you've, dem you've said and demonstrated that today's challenge is not technology, but psychology, and that it's, uh, it's about these mindsets. Uh, um, how, how do we properly, besides showing them the thousand solutions and speaking about it, go about changing those international, local, and uh, national mindsets of, of the delegates, the diplomats, the, um, what's the best way to do that? Give them an advantage to change and show them they will win more if they change than if they don't change. They will earn more money. They will have more advantage. They will have more power. You know, even for the oil producing countries, they are afraid. They are really afraid to lose their wealth. But if you show them that the world is now demanding a lot of hydrogen, and hydrogen can be made with solar cells in very warm countries that are currently producing oil, it is a diversification that can help them to survive. Otherwise, they will die, and they will fight against all the climate regulations. It's, it's like this everywhere. You have a, a company called Total um, uh, producing oil in France. It's very interesting to see that they have now called themselves Total Energy. And they are going to reduce their part of oil in order to increase the part of electricity, hydrogen, renewable energy, energy efficiency. But this is something logical. They, they know that if they want to survive, they have to, to do that. And we have to help them to, to do it. We basically have to make an alliance with all the people who would like to change, and we need to help them to change. You've had a lot of learning lessons in, in just in the past four years, but in all your adventures that have kind of shown that you, you hit some roadblocks that people tell you, oh, no, that's impossible. How is your, your wisdom that you give to your thousand plus solutions and to others that you need to deal with people to say, find those people who don't know that it's not impossible? Yes, you know, the impossible does not exist in the reality. The impossible exists in the mindset of the people who are sticking to old ways of thinking. And they believe with their learning with their experience of the past that something is impossible. But if you learn how to change the paradigm, change the way of thinking, then you open completely new opportunities that will allow you to make something possible. And you know, it's exactly like the first airplane. The first airplane was made out of wooden cloth in 1903 which means that the Egyptians could have flown from the top of their pyramids 5,000 years ago. But they did not do it because they believed that it was prohibited by the gods, by the mythology. And in the beginning of the 20th century, you had some explorers who said, we don't care about these old rules. We don't have the Inquisition anymore. The church is not going to burn us if we break the, the, the paradigms and the dogmas and they started to fly. So it shows really that, you know, if you want to innovate, it's not a question of, ha of having new ideas. If you want to innovate, it's a question of getting rid of old beliefs. And then you, you have the mind and the heart empty enough to welcome something new. And you don't have this filter that always tell you everything is impossible. You are just empty enough, you welcome what is new and you take it and you see how you can use it. And that's how you can be really, really progressive, innovative, inventive, and successful. Are there any new things besides what you've already told us about that are kind of on the horizon 
Um, uh, I, I've, I've heard heard a little bit that you've kind of compared your financial measurement uh, of the thousand solutions to some other things that are emerging or out there on, in the industry that kind of say, how can we change this mindset? Are there any other tools that we can look forward on your website? Um, and, and then I guess the, the biggest question, you're not going to start turning people away. Or are you going to continue collecting more solutions? Or are you going to say yeah. we've capped out at a thousand or? No, 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 no. We, we have proven that it works. So now we welcome all the other solutions. They will have to submit their file. Uh, it will be given to our bunch of experts. We have a group between 350 and 420 experts, depending when, and uh, they assess the solutions. And that's how we can give the, the label. So we, we continue. And there are several things that are very promising but they cannot have the label today because they are not yet profitable. For example, car carbon capture. You have a, a company in Zurich that I admire very much. It's called the Climeworks. They do a great job. They can absorb CO2 from the air. It would be fantastic for the future, but you need a price of carbon of roughly $200, Euro, uh, $200 per ton of CO2 to make it profitable. Otherwise, they have to turn on subsidies and not profit. So it doesn't go in our, in our assessment uh, criteria. So we cannot take them. But as soon as they manage to reduce the price of their operations and their machines, and that we maybe have a price of carbon that, has, that, that is increasing, the two curves will, will hit each other. And then we can give the label. And I'm really looking forward to it because it's a, it's a great technology. I have four more questions for you. Only one hard one, really. It is the burning question. WTF? And no, it's not the swear word that we've all been thinking about this last crazy times that we've experienced, but it's what's the futures? And uh, you're so good at setting the vision and, and capturing the pioneers and the innovators and, and letting them know that you want to hear about those solutions. But for you, what, what's the futures? Well, the futures, you have several different futures. One is that you do nothing, that we continue like we have done in the past. And we will have a miserable quality of life on this planet with a return of tropical disease in warm, in a, uh, sorry, in a tempered countries like Europe or North America. Uh, terrible tropical disease, typhoons, uh, droughts, uh, floods, uh, millions of climate refugees. Well, it will really make life difficult and a lot of people will suffer. Or, or we take it as a fantastic challenge now to implement the new solutions, implement the new technologies, become more efficient, make an alliance with industry, finance, economy, politics, in order to bring on the market everything we need to save resources, save energy, go into circular economy, and it pays for itself, it's profitable, and we'll have a good quality of life. And now the question is, which one are we going to choose? And sometimes I'm a bit pessimistic when I see the type of decisions that we take, because it takes far too much time to decide the right thing. Although we have all the solutions that allow us to decide today. The biggest um, thing that really touched my heart and, uh, that, you, that you've said uh, was when you were in Solar Impulse and you spoke live to Ban Ki-moon uh, on the signing of, of the, the Paris Agreement. And uh, it was to a smaller group, not the full assembly, but it was so... It just touched me. It not only was a historical moment that you made, it was a historical moment that the world was making. Uh, you know what diplomats and politicians and delegates and 
how long, how hard it is to let alone to agree on where they're going to eat lunch or what they're going to agree around, let alone 197, I believe it was that came together and agreed and, and signed the agreement. That is a historical precedent. It's the world's first moonshot, the global earth shot. It's a historical date for humanity. And you were from the cockpit making history yourself on that day. I, I, I just, I, I'm at awe with you and I appreciate your inspiration to get down and put the actions into, into reality, to start being a pioneer, start to innovate, start to do those things and that the support will come. And that's also why I said, you're such a great delegate because to do the adventures you've done, you've had to deal with countries and politicians all around the world and everybody's probably telling you a different thing or that's not possible. Don't go here. You can't do this. And you're like, how am I ever going to get this done? And so you've been there, you've done it. And, and, and for me, I really would like to get some wisdom for my listeners. How, how do they deal with those frustrations without giving up? What hope can you give them to say, Hey, that's just how the world works, but, but be persistent don't give up, you know, uh, give us a little inspiration what's led you through besides your, your father and your grandfather being great examples to help you through these hard times. I understood that I had to push hard. Um, it took me two years to get the overflight permission from China to fly with my balloon. And I knew that without having this permission, I would never be able to fly around the world in the balloon. So you need to be persistent very persistent. And uh, today, we need to push the decision makers to take the right decisions. And we all have a, a power for that. When the children go in the streets for the climate strike, for climate, uh, Friday for climate and things like that, it's very useful. Of course, they don't, they don't bring solutions. They are wishful thinking. They believe that you can just change all the economical system and the world will be okay. No, it's not like this. But nevertheless, they are pushing in the right direction. And for, for example, in Switzerland, you have some cantons, some states of Switzerland, which declared the climate emergency because there were strikes of children in the streets. So it is useful. Now the media, the media have to do their part because the politicians will take the decisions according to the support they have in the media in order to be reelected. So the media have to push. The media are not here just to give, uh, to make a debate between the 1% of climate deniers and the 99% of people who know that climate is, climate is changing. That's not the role of the media. The media have to be really proactive and show the solutions, the processes, the mindset we need. They have to push also. And of course, what we need also is to have uh, business leaders who push. We have partners who are supporting the Solar Impulse Foundation. And uh, twice, one, one last year and one this year, we did a manifesto where these business leaders we're committing to ask the governments to have more ambitious regulations for climate and environment. And why do they accept to do that? They accept because there are two things that they cannot afford in business. It is unpredictability and distortion of competitivity. And today, everything is uncertain. You don't know where to invest. And if you have the one who are pioneers and invest in the good direction, maybe it will be a disadvantage for them in the competitivity with others. So this is why the business leaders now are starting to ask for clear regulations. Are we going to go into electric mobility? Yes or no? If yes, they're going to invest. If no, they will not invest. Are we going into recycling of waste? instead of exporting the waste to China? If yes, then we will make an industry about waste management. You know, and there are so many decisions like this uh, that can guarantee the transition 
to the ecology and, and energy uh, revolution. I love that. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? It would be look at all the resources you use, all the things you have in your hands, everything you produce, consume, and throw away. Look at it as if the price was one million times more expensive. And then suddenly you, you understand what it means to be respectful. When you are brushing your teeth, why do you leave the tap open and losing water? If it is a million dollars per liter, you would not do that. So why do you do it? Because it is cheap. Ridiculous, you are just wasting resources. Why do you put air conditioning at 15 degrees Celsius when everybody's freezing? You put it at 25 degrees Celsius, it's far enough. And you save 50% of the energy that you were wasting before. Just look at all the consequences of your actions. And then you will start to be efficient. You will start to be respectful. And you will maybe also invest in a new heating system in an insulation for your house or for your office that will allow you to waste less energy, you will have LED light bulbs that are 95% efficient instead of the incandescent light bulb that is 5% efficient. You know, you have all this even as an individual level, you can do a lot. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact. And I guess I have a sub question of that as well. Are there places that are still left to be explored? Are there adventures still to be taken? Are there still things that we need to, to really discover and, and do? I think there has been a lot of things done today with a lot of pollution. Let's try to do it again with no pollution with renewable energies, with clean technologies. This is what I wanted to do with Solar Impulse. Solar Impulse is not the first airplane who could fly, but it was the first airplane that could fly with no fuel day and night. So it's like a new cycle that, that is starting and we can do that everywhere. I love that. What, and this is the last question. What have you experienced or learned in your journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start and said, boy, I'd been decades ahead or I wish I knew this in the beginning. I don't know, but if you know in advance, it's not exploration anymore. <laughs> I love that. Bertrand, I'm so thankful for your time. Uh, I thank you for letting us inside of your ideas. You're so wise and such a great diplomat. And uh, I, I'm, on bated breath following what you're doing, but I, I'll tell you as well, a lot of my listeners and I, you're going to see some more solutions coming your way because I definitely want to take more actions than I currently am to make sure that we make this transition and create that beautiful world that we, we want for all of us. And let's have hope because the frustration coming from the failure of the international negotiations is now pushing local actors to do much more. Regions, cities, instead of continents, corporations individually, instead of all the industry worldwide. So the failure of the top down is probably preparing the success to the bottom up. I agree. Thank you so much. And if there's an, anything else you want to tell us before I say goodbye, that's all I have for you today. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. It was really nice to see you again. And uh, I hope all your listeners will see how they can use new technologies to be more efficient, to be more profitable, to be cleaner, to protect the environment and contribute to the also the global wealth of, of, of this world that is allowing people to have more health, more comfort, more safety than centuries ago. So progress is, is good, but we need a progress that is clean and efficient. And the adventure today is to contribute to it. And we're all in the same adventure. And I hope your listeners will feel even more 
empowered to, to contribute. So thank you, Mark, for this invitation. Thank you so much, Bertrand. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you soon. With pleasure. Bye-bye.